Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk a little bit about bizarre design decisions. Throughout aviation history, perhaps in an effort to push the envelope, perhaps in an effort to establish a whole new paradigm, or perhaps in an exercise of plain old stupidity and stubbornness, designers and companies will attempt to incorporate design features and design concepts that just don't work out. These attempts can be viewed as being ridiculous or insane in hindsight, or can be viewed as that in the moment, with military leadership and whatnot looking at these attempts with confusion and contempt. There are honestly countless examples of design features that are absolutely insane, so in the interest of not making a video that has infinite length, I'll pick out three of my favorite bizarre design decisions, specifically from aircraft that I've made videos on. One, the Huter HU-136's cockpit canopy. In an effort to make an armored attacker and dive bomber, Huter decided to make their canopy out of steel, with small slits in the front and side for pilot vision. This would restrict vision an insane amount, forcing the pilot to basically fly literally blind. Two, the Republic XF-91 Thunderceptor's wings. In an effort to solve the pitch-up problem that a lot of early swept-wing jet aircraft faced, where the wingtips would stall out and throw the nose up violently, throwing the plane out of control, and as this often occurred at slower speeds and lower altitudes, like during takeoff and landing, this problem often proved to be deadly. So to try and counter that, Republic made a swept wing aircraft with wings that didn't taper off to be smaller, but instead were inverse and got larger towards the tips. Surprisingly, this actually worked, but the design didn't advance past the prototype phase as the American military elected to basically just wait a couple years for more advanced designs. And third, I'll go with the SAC AS-6, a circular wing aircraft. The story behind the AS-6 is quite bizarre as well, as it was actually designed by a farmer, and despite his small-scale model performing quite poorly, some German leadership saw it and thought it was interesting looking and brought it to life as a full-scale aircraft, where it also performed poorly. But yeah, a farmer made a crappy frisbee with an engine that got further than it should have because somebody with power thought it looked pretty neat. But for our subject, or subjects, plural for today, we actually have a trifecta of bizarre designs that I wanted to talk about for two reasons. One, they all looked kinda weird, which initially drew my interest. And two, Two of the three designs had an incredibly bizarre feature that, to put it simply, spiked pilots into the ground like a football, the Rob Gronkowski of aircraft. This is a trio of ground attackers from Bhutan Paul. This is the Bhutan Paul P-99, P-100, and P-101. Their collective stories began in early 1942, with a new British specification that a few websites list as specification F-642. However, this is probably not accurate, as the F denotes a fighter project, and the aircraft of the specification we're talking about were to be ground attackers or bombers or something which probably would have called for a B, a P, or maybe even an A letter designation. And honestly, more than likely, the specification did not last long enough to really receive an official classification number. Regardless, though, this unnamed designation sought a maneuverable low-level ground attacker, intended to replace a variant of the Hawker Hurricane in the Mark IId. This hurricane variant was used in a ground attack and specifically a tank buster role. Aircraft had incredible potential in the tank buster role, as tanks typically concentrated their armor on the front, sides, and rear faces, specifically the faces that were perpendicular or somewhat perpendicular to the ground. 
as these faces would be taking the brunt of the impact from enemy tank fire. And while the tank surfaces on top of the hull and top of the turret were armored, the armor there was much thinner, as they would receive less impact and focused fire. This is where aircraft could come in, attacking from above and targeting that thinner armor. But even though that armor was thinner, aircraft guns at the time, typically 7.62mm or 12.7mm, just weren't strong enough to pierce that. So this is where something like the Hurricane Mark IId comes in. Instead of normal machine guns, it instead had 40 mil cannons held in underwing pods, with a singular machine gun in each wing that would be outfit with tracer rounds to help aim the 40 mil cannons. These actually proved to be quite effective, so much so that the squadron outfit with the 2D was named the Flying Can Openers. But even still, the Hurricane wasn't a super high-performing plane and could certainly be improved upon, which led to the early 1942 specification for a new ground attacker. For this role, the British Air Ministry, of course, wanted something with a lot of offensive power, and really high speed wasn't terribly important. A top speed of at least 280 miles an hour was sought, which is actually pretty low for a mid-war spec. But offensively, the prospective ground attacker would be absolutely insane for the era and possibly unmatched in World War II, with it having an armament at least equal to the Hurricane 2D and its 240mm cannons. The prospective aircraft would have either three 40mm cannons 240mm and 220mm cannons, 147mm and 220mm cannons, 220mm cannons and a number of rockets, and at absolute minimum, 420mm cannons. Which, honestly, that last one probably wouldn't have been actually accepted, and I do kind of question whether or not the Air Ministry would have even listed that as an acceptable armament setup. Additionally, the design would also need excellent maneuverability at low altitude and excellent vision from the cockpit, so the pilot could spot his various ground targets. I would also assume that the plane would need solid armor, given how close it would be to enemy ground fire. To this specification, several companies would submit designs, some of whom would submit several designs, and one of the designs I actually made a video about a long time ago, a design that was in the running for strangest aircraft design features, in the Martin Baker Tank Buster. This rather unique Anteater-esque design went all out on its armament, and went above the requested 40 mil cannons, and above the requested 47 mil cannon, and instead it had a singular 57 mil cannon with 30 rounds. Unfortunately for Martin Baker though, them using just a single cannon ended up being part of the reason why their design was rejected. A single 57 mil cannon couldn't really be used in other scenarios, it just wasn't versatile enough. But for the first design of our Bhutan Paul trifecta, Overall, it wasn't as weird as the Tank Buster, and it actually looked a little bit similar to it. Unfortunately, as far as I could find from what limited information on this series of aircraft exists, none of them had the dimensions listed, so we can only really guess at how large they would have been. For Bhutan Paul's first design in the P-99, using its proposed engine to try and guesstimate the size, I'll put in an estimate at 14.4 meters long. The P-99 was to be a twin-boom ground attacker, not too dissimilar from something like Sweden's Saab J-21, but its overall design would be altered to better fit the requested specifications. The cockpit would be moved up to the front of the fuselage right at the nose, giving the pilot excellent vision to his front and sides. Just under the pilot is likely where the armament would have been contained. 
going with some arrangement of the 40mm, 20mm, and or 47mm cannons, and held under wing could be some combination of rockets and or bombs. At the rear of the fuselage, in between the twin booms of the twin boom tail, would be the engine and a set of contra-rotating propellers, and the engine in question would be a Rolls-Royce Griffin, an effective successor to the legendary Rolls-Royce Merlin that had around 2,000 horsepower. It was this engine that I used to make a rough guess at the size of the plane. Back over at the tail, instead of your standard twin boom tail with a simple horizontal surface in the middle and the vertical surfaces split between the end of the twin booms, the P-99 effectively had a standard single fin tail. While that single fin looked pretty weird on a twin boom design, that really wasn't the strangest design feature. Instead, the strangest feature, and the feature that made me want to talk about it in the first place, was how the pilot would bail out in an emergency. Because it was a pusher prop, if the pilot bailed out, he would be flung back into the propeller, which was somewhat less than ideal, I think. While other pusher props, like the P-99, elected to have the propeller blow itself off and detach before the pilot bailed, the P-99 elected to spike the pilot into the ground. The pilot and cockpit would be connected to some kind of crude swinging arm type mechanism, and to eject, the bottom of the fuselage would be blown off, and the pilot would be thrown down, clear of the propeller. Why they didn't elect to throw the pilot up, I don't really know, and this ejection mechanism was made worse by the fact that the P-99 was a ground attacker and would be close to the ground. So depending on how close the plane was to the ground, it may have actually been just as dangerous for the pilot to eject. Ultimately, the P-99 wouldn't advance past the drawing board, but perhaps Bhutan Paul's other submissions to this specification would fare better. First, in the even stranger-looking P-100, strongly resembling something like the Curtis XP-55 Ascender, the P-100 was a canard wing pusher prop, also featuring a contra-rotating propeller and presumably the Rolls-Royce Griffin engine. The armament would also likely be concentrated in the nose as well, and a number of rockets or bombs would likely be held under wing. In their initial research, Bhutan Paul found that the P-100 would likely be faster than the P-99, making it a more enticing option. However, in addition to the fact that also like the P-99, the Air Ministry believed that they would take way too long to develop and produce such an unorthodox plane, the P-100 also shared the P-99's ejection system. This method just made absolutely no sense for a low-flying ground attacker, and if either the P-99 or P-100 had made it further than the drawing board, this ejection method almost certainly would have been altered to either fling the pilot upward or just blow the propeller off the frame. But for Bhutan Paul's third and final submission to this specification in the P-101, it appears as though they took the note that their first two designs would take too long to produce to heart, and they went wildly away from the first two designs and kind of went back in time. Just looking at the fuselage from the side, it appears as though Bhutan Paul went back to the mid to late 1930s, and the fuselage looked a bit more bulbous and stubby. Instead of having the cockpit in the nose like the first two, they elected to have a more typical and standard cockpit that wouldn't really have better vision than your typical fighter of the era. But the most eye-catching and perhaps baffling design decision, or decisions plural, came over in the wings and the landing gear, as they elected to make the P-101 a biplane with fixed, chunky landing gear. Now, why exactly they decided to make it a biplane, I don't know. 
and I couldn't find anything explaining why they did this. I mean, biplanes were pretty agile, and the extra wings would probably shorten the takeoff run, so maybe that's why they did it? Honestly, though, I feel more like they made this design out of anger and frustration. With the first two designs rejected, in part because they would take too long to develop, it's as if Bhutan Paul was throwing their hands up and saying, fine, you want something easy to develop? You want something with a proven design? You want something that can be ordered off the drawing board? Well, here you go. I mean, there certainly wouldn't have been any mystery on how a biplane would perform, and having the landing gear be fixed would make the P-101 much easier to produce. Making it even easier to produce was the fact that the wings of the P-101 would be taken directly from the Bhutan Paul Defiant. So, almost certainly, the P-101 could have been ordered off the drawing board, could have been rapidly produced, and probably would have had rather predictable performance. And armed with an assortment of 20 mil and 40 mil cannons, it would be pretty powerful as well. At the same time though, vision from the cockpit was comparatively poor, and the extra wings would degrade higher speed performance. And unsurprisingly, the P-101 would be rejected, or basically just ignored. So ultimately, none of the Bhutan Paul designs made it past the drawing board, and none of the other several proposed designs did so either. Instead, the Air Ministry decided that it was basically now pointless to pursue a new dedicated ground attacker, and instead, currently existing aircraft, fighters and fighter bombers, would be modified or utilized in the tank buster role from fitting common British fighters with cannons again, to utilizing newer fighter bombers like the Hawker Typhoon and Tempest, outfit with unguided rockets and bombs. Essentially, the Air Ministry favored more versatile, multi-role aircraft over a more dedicated single-role aircraft. Overall, while all three of the designs are quite interesting and quirky in one way or another, I feel like maybe the more interesting part is that they tell a story of frustration, from making two designs that, while unconventional, and while they spiked pilots into the ground like a football, they may have had some potential, and they seem to get mad that they got rejected and submitted the third design out of spite, and while doing so may have proven some kind of point, I guess, doing that doesn't get you production contracts. Spike designs don't lead to contracts. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. So recently, I decided to play Days Gone again because I wanted to fight the zombie hordes in the game, and I got reminded of how much I hate the main character. Like, they tried to make him and his dialogue more realistic, but imagine if I stuttered every tenth word and then I just left that in the video. That's what the dialogue of the entire game is like. So anything story related in the game, I just skip it because it's way too annoying to listen to. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.